Oh, recording in progress. Uh, it's a little bit difficult doing these talks over the Zoom. I always feel like I'm talking to myself, and apparently that's one of the signs of madness, and maybe I'm well progressed along that way. But I did want to give you a little bit of information about my background so that you know what's happening here. So my specialty is in local government. It's quite unusual for an academic to be an adjunct professor for a university overseas, let alone one of the top universities overseas. So I'm adjunct professors in three, three different countries, three of the top universities in the world. So it seems to be the case that my colleagues think that I'm one of the best at what I do. So I live and work from my farm in Moomby. That photo there, the glamour shot, you can see is my back paddock. Now, Moomby is a little village about 30 k's out of Tenworth, a little bit like a lot of the villages that you guys come from. So I hope that means that I sort of get what you're going through because I'm not sitting here in Sydney telling you how to run your life. So Jess, could we go to the next slide, please? So this is really important. Now, I don't even know if you've got your surveys yet, but apparently you're going to get sent the same survey as the people who attended the meetings. It's really, really important that you don't fill in the survey until I've finished the presentation. We've already had phone surveys in the past where people ask you whether you want to be de-amalgamated or not. But if you don't have good information, you can't make good decisions. And that's what this talk is all about. A lot of the information that people thought was reliable in the past, I'll actually show you is probably not reliable at all. Next slide, please. So it's important to know that this is not just me doing this work. It's not just my show. There's three other professors involved in the work. Yongji Kim, she's one of my colleagues from SNU in Korea. She did most of the training in America. She trained under Mildred Warner, who's one of the top dogs in America. Uh, she actually critiqued my work at the end of it. And in shortly, you'll see a letter from her attesting to the quality of the work. Professor Ferreira from IST Portugal. He's one of the leaders in efficiency and scale analysis in the world, probably number two. So you've had the top people in the world working on this. And the whole project is overseen by my boss, Professor Roberta Ryan. Next slide, please. So this is a letter from Yongji Kim. As I say, she's a leader in this field in her own right. I don't know if you can read it there clearly enough or not, but basically she says, look, the work is good quality. It's world's best practice work written by someone that went into the matter thoroughly. And I have spent about three and a half months only looking at SVC and nothing else. Okay, next slide, please. But there's nothing that will ever make up for reading the full report. And the full report will turn up ultimately. But at the moment, it is only a draft report. That's because I'm only at the draft stage. I haven't done the community engagement yet. I haven't got your surveys back. I haven't heard the questions that you're going to ask at the end of these sessions and the questions that other people will ask at the end of every second, of, 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 of the other two sessions. It's important to understand I'm not a boundaries commission. I'm not a boundaries commissioner. I'm not a commercial consultant. I'm a professor of economics who's getting evidence, proper, robust, rigorous evidence, evidence together so that you guys can make good decisions. And I will go to my grave saying that I believe if you give people good information, they make good decisions. The problem is that in the past, we haven't had good information and that's made it difficult for people to make good decisions. I will also point out that unlike other people that you've dealt with in the past, if you guys can leave your cameras on, it actually helps me because then I can see people's facial expressions and make sure you're still <clears> there. Uh, other people in the past, I you do know who it is that's writing these reports. Um, you know my qualifications. You know who I am. I've actually fronted you. You are going to see the full report in total, unlike the Deloitte's reports, KPMG reports, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that gives you some confidence about the fact that I'm obviously not ashamed of my work or scared of, my, of what you might find or anything like that. Completely open and transparent. You'll get to read every word of it, and I hope you will enjoy all 114 pages. If any of you have trouble sleeping at night, let me recommend the report as a reliable sleep aid for you. Next slide, slide please. So this is a quote, I'm almost invariably used these days when I talk to people in public forums, but it's how I feel about things. It was written by a dude called Moses Bembermonides. He was a famous natural law philosopher. My background's very diverse. My first degree was mathematics. My second one was theology. Then I did a degree in commerce and then I did a PhD in economics. So I'm all over the place. My wife will attest to that. 
But anyway, my favourite philosopher is this bloke called Moses Mem- Ben Maimonides. He was a physician to Salahuddin, you know, the bloke that kicked the crusaders out. He was such a good physician that Richard the Lionheart actually tried to steal him off Salahuddin and take him back to England to look after him. But that's not the important thing. He wrote this book called The Guide for the Perplex. It's one of the most famous books in this area of philosophy. And he writes this comment, and this is something I believe. Truth does not become more true by virtue of the fact that the entire world agrees with it, nor less so even if the whole world disagrees with it. And some of what I'm going to say you're going to want to hear and some of it you're not going to want to hear. But I went on a mission to find truth. I actually believe there is one truth in all these things. And I'm presenting what I believe is the truth. And whether you like it or not, it's still going to be the truth afterwards. What you do with it and what your counsellors do with it, that's their business. That's not my job. It's not my job to make a de-amalgamation happen or to sell a de-amalgamation or anything else. My job is to give you truth so you have good facts to make good decisions. Next slide, please. So I'm going to briefly remind you of the promises made back in 2015 and the minister's proposal. Not because I want to rehash what's happened in the past. I don't want to get into those blame games. That's not going to help us at all. What we need to do is think about the future, what is best for this community in the future. However, there is something important you need to understand. You'll probably understand this. There's a thing called negativity bias in economics. And basically what it says is if someone promises you something and they don't deliver on the promise, the further reality is from the promise, the more the grudge you hold and the longer you hold the grudge and the more likely you will be to act on the grudge. And if you reflect on your own life, that's true, isn't it? If someone promises you something and they don't deliver, you bear a grudge. And the more they don't deliver, the more your grudge is, is gets going and the longer you keep it, the more likely you are to do something about it. So that's why these promises are important. So what were you promised? You were promised $20 million in financial benefits over 20 years. You were promised that by 2020 onwards, you would be saving $600,000 a year. You were promised that you'd have greater capacity to effectively manage and reduce your infrastructure backlog. You were promised to reduce the reliance on increases through special rate variations. Promises were made about planning and economic development. Promises were made about shared communities of interest, effective representation, and effective advocacy. Now, some people will say none of those promises were kept, and some people will say all those promises were kept. And I think both of those arguments are implausible. Clearly, some of them were kept and some weren't. We need to decide what would happen if we changed the structure in terms of those promises. So if we go go to the next slide, please. Now, there's been an important change since the Boundary Commission in 2020-2021. And you can look up the piece of legislation yourself. It's called the Local Government Act 1993. There's a New South Wales website. You can download the whole thing. The bit that you want is called Section 218CC. And there's a new piece that was put into the legislation. And it basically says the state government is responsible for the entire cost of a de-amalgamation you will not pay for the de-amalgamation. Now, when you're interpreting legislation, there's three things that we we look at. But ultimately, we won't know precisely how it will be interpreted unless it goes to court and a judge rules on it. But usually, this is how it's worked out. And I, I got advice from a very senior legal counsel for another state government. So you look at the Acts Interpretation Acts, and that tells you how you decide on the meanings of words. You look at the Hansard, that's the record of what the politicians in the state parliament were talking about when they introduced this legislation. The idea there is try to work out what was the intent of the politicians, what did they want to achieve from this legislation, and then you actually look at the words itself in section 218cc. Now, I've done that job for you, and I've got legal advice. My advice is that it was clearly in the intent of the politicians for that section, the legislation, to be interpreted very broadly to cover as much of the de-amalgamation cost as possible and as is reasonable. Now, that's nice in one sense, but when you think about it, that's just natural justice, a concept that goes back two and a half thousand years ago to Aristotle. And the way I explain it is like this. If I was driving in my car, and I'm getting a bit old and doddery these days, and I plough into the back of your car, 
You don't expect me to hop out and start yelling and abusing you and telling you that you must pay for my car's damage and you must also pay for your car damage because I don't care that it's your fault, it's your problem. You don't wouldn't expect that, would you? That's not natural justice. And this is actually a view and a lens through which the judicial system in Commonwealth countries under common law view things. You expect that the person who was negligent or the person who made the bad decision bears the consequences of the decision, not the innocent victim. And in, in a lot of respects, communities were the innocent party in these amalgamations. Unless you went and actually activated for the amalgamation, there's very few communities that were, well, then it was a decision, unless you were in that situation, it was a decision of the state government. They made the decision. They're responsible for the consequences. And basically, that's what the, your MPs were saying in your state parliament when they introduced this legislation. They were saying, we made the decision. Let's go in pear shape. It's up to us to do the right thing, fix it as much as possible, and get as close as possible to the situation that you were in previously. So if we can go down to the next slide, please. Now I need to bore you for a little bit, I'm afraid, and them's, them's the breaks. I can't do much about it. One of the things you would have heard about in 2016 and in 2021-22 was these economies of scale. You hear about it all the time. Economies of scale, economies of scale, economies of scale. And I'm yet to hear anyone talk about it in a slightly sensible, correct fashion. So let's go through the story. It goes back to a bloke called Adam Smith. He was the father of economics, 1787, around that sort of time. He wrote in his book, it's in one of the first chapters of his famous book, The Wealth of Nation. He, he writes about a pin factory. So we're talking about haberdashery pins here, the pins that you use when you're sewing. And he said, and apparently in the olden days, a person would just make the whole pin. They'd cut a piece of wire, they'd sharpen one end, and then they'd solder a head onto it. And he went to the factory and he saw that this had, the output had been increased. And as a result, they had three staff members. And they assigned one staff member just to cutting wire well, all day, every day. Another staff member just to sharpening the edge all day, every day. Another staff member just to soldering the head on. And he said that in his book that there was a 240-fold increase in production with the same amount of resources. And that's your economies of scale argument. And that's amazing, isn't it? Imagine you could produce 245 to 240 times as much stuff for the same cost. That's great. But the problem is any proper bona fide economist knows from their basic undergraduate high school education onwards that economies of scale do not occur for every single function. Now, consider the dog catching function. Say you doubled the area and the double, doubled the number of dogs you had to catch and your dog catchers were already working at maximum capacity. What would be the response? You'd need twice as many dog catchers, wouldn't you? Wouldn't save you money at all. So where you can save money is when there's the potential to specialise or if you have machinery that's not being fully used that could be used more than what it currently is, there could be economies of scale. And I did a, quite a famous paper now back in 2015, I believe it was, looking at the 11 functions of local government in New South Wales at the time. And what we found there was that there's only actually three functions that have economies of scale, only three out of the 11. Most functions don't. And overall, you'll be very surprised what you find out. So that's the first part of the lecture. And there's three parts of this lecture in Econ 101. But as you've all discovered already, I'm extremely boring. And most people seem to nod off to sleep after the first part of the lecture. Hence, we have all these commercial consultants and some politicians running around going, economy is the scale, it's the answer to everything. Well, if it is the answer to everything, I have a really simple solution to you. We've got 538 councils in Australia. Let's amalgamate them all into one, have one council for all of Australia. We'll pay hey, next to no rates. We can drive along on gold-plated roads and we'll all be happy. Now, the problem is, as I say, that is that I'm a boring person and people miss the second and the third part of the story. So see that little curve there, B? See when it's heading downhill there? I don't have a pointer here today, so I can't point at it. When it's heading downhill, that's economies of scale. Those average total costs are reducing as output increases. But then you'll see that it flattens out quite horizontally. That's the region of constant returns to scale. And any proper bona fide economist will tell you 
even if there are economies of scale, we know eventually you get to the situation where there's no more savings to be made from specialisation. There's a limit to how many steps you can break down making pins into. And at that point, even if you get bigger, nothing's going to happen to the cost. They're just going to remain constant. That's the second part. Even at that stage, there's no real drama. There's no real danger. The problem is that people miss out on the third part of this story, which is if you increase, keep increasing production past that constant returns of scale, the curve starts heading up again. That's diseconomies of scale. That's when your average total costs are increasing as output increases. Now, why might that happen? If you've ever worked in a small organisation or a big organisation, you know yourself what happens. In bigger organisations, there's less transparency because you're dealing with a $70 million budget instead of a $7 million budget. You don't agonise quite as much over every dollar as what you used to. It's easier for people to fly under the radar in a big organisation than what it is in a little organisation. In a big organisation, the bigger you get, the more time and effort you need to spend into coordinating all the different staff members because you might have twice as many staff members as before. In a bigger organisation, the senior management are likely to be paid more. Generally, pay is worked out on the size of the budget, the number of staff you've got to look after and the location. Obviously, if your size is doubled, number of staff is doubled, you expect your remuneration to go up significantly. In a bigger organisation, you almost always end up with an extra layer of middle management as sort of a bridge, as an interpreter between the senior management and everyone else. That's where these diseconomies of scale come in. Now, these things can be measured quite precisely. And any economist in this field worth their weight We'll do so. Now, I think it's quite a rudimentary task. For me, it's like doing long division. It's no big deal. But unfortunately, we got commercial consultants involved. And they didn't bother measuring whether these economies of scale did or did not exist. That's hard to believe, isn't it? The state government told us it was a $1 billion reform. They paid $400-something thousand dollars to KPMG yet they didn't bother to actually measure whether economies of scale did or did not exist. They merely took an assumption is the word they used. The word that you probably should have used was flying guess. They took a flying guess that you would say 4%. They worked out what 4% was and confidently told you that's how much money you would be saved. Now, that's what I call giggle and guess. And that is really terrible because a lot of people's lives were changed from that giggle and guess, and I think they deserve better than that. I won't be giving you giggle and guess. I'll be giving you proper, robust, reliable evidence. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So this is a multiple regression analysis. This is my trade. You might be a farmer, a carpenter, a builder, whatever. I'm an econometrician. So it's really hard to explain what I do, and I don't think you want the lengthy explanation anyway, but let me tell you a story. Cast your mind back to the best moment in your life. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm in a year nine maths classroom and my teacher just told me that Y equals MX plus C. And she told me that if she gives me a formula like Y equals 3X plus 4 and then tells me what X is, you can work out what Y is. You all did this in school and I'm sure it was a life-changing event. That's basically what I do, but that's called linear regression. I do multiple regression and I do it through time. So instead of a straight line, imagine you're sitting in the middle of the earth in a steer. The steer is revolving around in circles and you're moving through time. That's what I'm doing. It's super complicated, painful maths. That's why I work for three unis overseas. I've got two more chasing me because no one wants to do it. As I keep telling my children, I train them in maths myself. If you're good at maths, you have a job for life because everyone hates it. Anyway, the long and the short of it is I did a multiple regression analysis looking at nine years of data. I did what should have been done back in 2015, looking to see whether there's economies of scale. And you'll see a table there. You see the uh, label there, population squared and population. If there's economies of scale next to the number that lines up along that line, you'll see stars next to the number. That means it's statistically significant, okay? You can see for the entire state that there is evidence of economies of scale. Can you see the stars there? Yep. Okay. 
So there's economies of scale at the whole state level. Look down at the next line, population density. You can see stars next to that. And you can also see a negative number. What that means is that as population, as density increases, unit costs decrease. It gets cheaper to run things as uh, places are more dense when houses are closer together. Okay, all fine and dandy. That's for the whole state. If you live in an urban area and you lived in a rural area, you know that urban Australia is nothing like rural Australia, is it? Urban local government is nothing like rural local government. Completely different organisations that do completely different things. In rural local government, we do water and sewer and we don't have bitumen on our roads most of the time. We don't have footpaths and street lights and we don't do adventure playgrounds and all these discretionary things they do in Sydney. We stick mostly to the basics. So what economists do is, because we realise these are completely different organisations, we do what we call stratification. We just look at the rural councils, and that's the next column that you can see there. So you're looking at the second column of numbers now, the rural councils. And what do you find when you look at population squared and population? Do you see any stars there? No. There is no evidence of economies of scale for rural local government. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't matter how much you want to believe in it, just like the two fairy and the Easter bunny and all those sorts of things. The truth of the matter is it just doesn't exist. That's a nine-year panel of audited financial statement data. It's beyond dispute. The economies of scale, you keep getting told, but just wait a little bit longer. These economies of scale are going to come and rescue you. Well, they don't exist. Everyone to this point in time has assumed that they exist. No one's actually bothered to go and do the work to measure to see whether they exist. And I'm telling you, they're not there. Look down at that third line, population density. It is still statistically significant for rural councils, which means the closer the houses are, the cheaper it is going to be to deliver services to you. And that's not surprising. You know, think about bin collection. The closer the houses are, the shorter you have to drive the truck to pick up the next bin, don't you? Of course it's going to be cheaper. Now, the problem is this. If you amalgamate councils, population increases, yes. But what happened to your houses? Did they suddenly up stumps and move closer together because you got amalgamated? No, it made no difference. It didn't change your population density. So there were no, there was no good reason to think that you were going to get any efficiency dividends or any material savings as a result of amalgamation. If we can move on to the next slide, please, Jess. So this next one is a graph of efficiency over SPC. If you read the Boundaries Commission's last reports last time, you got told about all these amazing efficiencies. Excuse me a little bit, a minute. Now, this graph goes from 2013 to 2022, and you're probably thinking, how on earth did you do that? We weren't amalgamated then. Well, the standard process is we just combine inputs and outputs prior to amalgamation, and then we can make a comparison. And what we're really seeing is the effect of the amalgamation. So to understand this, you've got to understand how do economists perceive efficiency? Efficiency is simply the conversion of inputs. What is the input? money and staff into outputs. What are the outputs? They're the things that local government do. Obviously, I can't list everything that local government do. So we proxy it with the, the main things that tell us mostly what local government does. So the inputs, your, your money and your staff, your outputs are the number of residential assessments, number of business assessments, number of farm assessments. Why do I split them all up? Because you all get different stuff, don't you? And then length of sealed roads, bitumen roads, and length of unsealed roads. Why are they there? They're the biggest single cost for local government. And obviously, there's a big difference in the cost between a sealed road and a dirt road. Yeah. So this is standard procedure for scholars. And we can look at what's happened to efficiency since 2013. Now, you're the dark blue line about the middle of the screen. You'll see it ranges from zero through to one. If you times it by 100, that'll give you a rough measure of efficiency. So if you're sitting about 0.5, just over 0.5 in 2013, that means you're 50% efficient relative to all the other councils, okay? So what happened over time? Amalgamation happened in 2016. It was six weeks short, and 2017 was six weeks long. Remember, financial year goes from 1st of July to 30th of June, but the amalgamations happened 12th of May. Okay, so those two years are a bit screwy, so don't get too hung up on 2016 and 2017. 
And some of the graphs you'll see, I actually just leave those years out because they were so screwed. What happened after the amalgamation? Let's look at 2018, 2019. Efficiency went up. Then what happened? Efficiency went down and down and down. And in this last year, it's had a little bit of a boost. Now, that is actually very similar to what happened in Queensland. I did a study of efficiency in Queensland after their 2008 amalgamation. And a similar thing happened. Those first two or three years after amalgamation, efficiency went up. Why? The current theory among scholars is because there was a lot of attention on efficiency. And if you've got regulators breathing over your shoulder, banging on about efficiency, and everyone's expecting it because amalgamation has been sold about efficiency, a lot of effort goes into being efficient. But over time, it's a bit like the New Year's resolution. You sort of drift back to old ways. And if you've got structural problems, as you can see, your efficiency is about 10% lower now than what it was prior to amalgamation. If you've got structural inefficiencies, over time, they will become obvious. And that's what's happened. Now, I will address a question that was said last night. Well, what about the bushfires? Yeah, well, they happened, of course, and they were traumatic events. And I'm sorry you went through them. And we did up my way too. I almost lost my house to them. And that contributed to the cost. But when I talk about things being robust statistical methods, this is an extremely complex thing called linear programming. We use Windows analysis and auto alpha protocols and Monte Carlo analysis. And the whole idea of having this really super sophisticated maths is to make sure that little unusual events don't lead us astray. So we've taken out the effect of little unusual events. And when we take out those effects, there is no doubt, this is world's best evidence by number two person in the world showing you that efficiency went down. It's just a fact. We may not like it, but it's there. If we can go to the next slide, please. Now, the next big thing that was said during the Boundaries Commission last time was that little councils can't be financially sustainable. And being an econometrician, I thought, well, I can test that because the New South Wales state government makes councils put in these seven financial ratios into the audited financial statements every single year. I went back to 2013. I got all the financial sustainability ratios that the New South Wales state government mandates themselves, their own ratios, not mine, the government's ratios. And I did a regression between a index of those ratios and the variables that might have something to do with them. And what I was really interested in is what happens when councils get bigger? Does financial sustainability improve or does it diminish or is there no relationship at all? Now, I was expecting no relationship to tell you the truth. What did I find? Have a look at that first column and it's the same as last time. If there's stars next to the thing, that means it's important, okay? First column there is the whole state. We can see that for the whole state, there's a negative sign in front of that number. You can see negative 0.401 and you can see two stars. Now, what that is telling us is that as councils get bigger, financial sustainability gets lower. It gets worse. It goes in the opposite direction. This is the New South Wales state government's own metrics by their own metrics. As councils get bigger, they get less sustainable. That's for the state as a whole. And as I told you before, rural councils are a different deal. So let's have a look at rural councils and that next column of numbers, the second column of numbers there. And you can see it's still statistically significant and it's still negative. So as rural councils get bigger, they become less financially sustainable. And a lot of you would have suspected that anyway, because you know that T Corp gave Tumor and Tumbarumba both the tick of approval in terms of financial sustainability, don't you? And you were rather small councils. And you know of bigger rural councils that were told that they weren't sustainable. So it's not surprising that this evidence is bearing out what we already know, which is that small councils can be sustainable. And in fact, by the New South Wales state government's own statistics, it tells us that small councils are more likely, more likely to be financially sustainable. Now, if you look at the actual number, you see how we've gone, the absolute value, we've gone from 0.4 up to 1.135. It's much bigger. What is that telling an econometrician? It's telling us that it's even more powerful in association for rural councils than what it is for the whole state. Look down at that next row, population density, and it's statistically significant again. What is that telling us? 
It's telling us that the more dense your council is, the more financially sustainable you're going to be. And that makes sense given the other econometric work we saw, didn't we? Remember I told you that the more dense you are, the cheaper it is to deliver services. So if it's cheaper to deliver services if you're more dense, it's not surprising that you're going to be more financially sustainable if you're more dense. But as I said, when you were amalgamated, your houses didn't all jump up in the air and join up next to each other and get closer to each other. It made no difference to the thing. The only thing you're controlling through amalgamation is population size. And as you can clearly see from the state government's own statistics, as you get bigger, you get less sustainable. Next slide, please. So what my problem is this, is that in 2015, 2016 and 2020, 21, all the emphasis was on money. You know, if you look at the legislation, it actually says what a boundaries commission and a minister must look at when they're deciding about amalgamation. And there's actually 11 factors. And only one of those 11 factors talks about money. Yet that's where all the emphasis has been. And the problem with this is this. People have lost sight of why we have government in the first place. If I wanted efficient and cheap service provision, I'd outsource it to business, wouldn't I? Don't all economists know that the cheapest, most efficient way of doing things is through business? The reason why we don't is that business can't make a quid on a lot of things that we do as a government, and they wouldn't care about little villages or things like that because there's not enough people there and you can't possibly make money. That's why we have government in the first place. And people have lost track of the whole point of government. The whole point of government is for people, staff and the community to get together and cooperate and work together to be all that we can be. And as soon as we forget that government's about people and start focusing on the dollars, we've totally missed the point. Now, a good example of this is this. You remember those little Lada cars, Lada cars you could get from Russia, little hatchbacks? They were cheap as chips, weren't they? Really, really cheap. Someone there remembers one. Maybe you had the misfortune of buying one. Cheap as chips, extremely efficient. You could run them all day in a drop of petrol, couldn't you? Now, okay, so you bought your laser, later car. You're driving there around, down the road. You think, oh, gee, I'm a clever fellow. I bought this really cheap. It's so efficient. And a car stops in front of you. You slam the brakes on and nothing happens. You plow into the other car and, you know, horrible things happen to you and your car. Do you still think that you got a good deal? No, you didn't. The car didn't do what it was meant to do. And you're now thinking it didn't matter how cheap it was or how efficient it was. If it didn't do what it was meant to do, it was defective. And that's actually the term that Aristotle uses. He says that the thing is either defective or it's effective. And if it's defective, if it's not doing what it was meant to do, it doesn't matter how cheap it is, how efficient it is, how much of a surplus you have, the whole things have been a waste of time. So please remember that local government is about people, not about dollars. I know that sounds strange coming from an economist, but that's the truth of the matter. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Just a little recap on what we've discussed so far before I move into the next topic. There is no evidence of economies of scale. Doesn't matter how much we want them to be there, there is no evidence of it. They're not coming to save you. Okay, you can wait forever. It's not happening. There is no evidence that efficiency improved. People have said it's improved, but they haven't given you any evidence for it. When we get it measured by the second best person in the world, we find out there is no evidence of it at all. There is no evidence that smaller councils will struggle. In fact, the state government's own evidence says the opposite. Now, if you remember back to the Boundaries Commission, three people said, yep, do you amalgamate? One person said no. If you read that dissenting report, the main reasons for dissenting were these three issues. That's why I spent so much time on them. And it, contrary to the person that wrote the dissenting report that just assumed a whole heap of things, I actually went and found evidence in every one of those three things that were assumed in the dissenting report were wrong, just plain wrong. There's no two ways about it. We can go to the next slide, please. But please bear in mind, I'm not trying to blame anyone. As I said, blame is an absolutely useless thing. It's not going to achieve anything. There's no point by blaming your current councillors, your current staff, former staff, former councillors, even boundaries commissions and things like that. That is not going to help us move forward. Now we're going to talk a bit about financial sustainability. 
Here, uh, once again, to look at the time prior to amalgamation, I just combined results. There's nothing tricky in doing that. You can look up these financial statements yourself. And what I'm looking at is what happened after amalgamation. There's two lines there, and I need to explain them. The blue line there includes capital grants. What are capital grants? That's when the state government gives you money to buy a particular piece of machinery or build a particular thing. By law, you can only spend that money on buying that particular piece of machinery or building that particular thing. A lot of people think that this is a good thing, getting all this capital grants money and the Boundaries Commission get telling you how wonderful it is, but you'll discover as we go on that was probably a very, very bad thing for you, okay, when it's new assets. If it's refurbishing existing assets, yeah, it's a great thing. Give me that free money. But if it's new assets that you've got to maintain and depreciate, it can end up being a very bad thing. Now, to explain this, the best idea is to talk about a scenario. If I gave you 50 bucks to go down to the bottle shop and get me a carton of beer, you're going to discover two things. Let's assume you're an honest person and you're going to get my carton of beer, okay? You're not just going to take off with my 50 bucks. First thing you're going to discover is that you're not 50 bucks better off because if you go down to the bottle shop and get the carton of beer and bring it back, you only had that money in your hand for a little while, but it wasn't actually yours. You couldn't do anything else with it. That's number one thing you're going to discover. The second, second thing you're going to discover is this. I've got expensive taste. I like Kirin beer. I got addicted to it when I was in Japan working or got used to it, got to like it. I'm not addicted to alcohol. Got to like it when I was in Japan. And Kirin beer is about 70 or 80 bucks a bottle box. And you're going to find out that you've got to pull out 20 or $30 out of your own wallet to buy this carton of beer. And that's essentially what's happening to your councils every time they get money for a capital grant. By the time they get the money, by the time they actually start the work, the amount of money they got doesn't actually cover the work. They've got to pull money out of your own bank account to pay for it. And that explains a graph that you're going to see in a few slides time about the problematic stake of our piggy bank at SBC. For all those reasons, I like to exclude the capital grants. And that's the orange line there. So what are we looking at here? Operating result. It's your income take away your expenses. And you can refer this to your own life. Think about your income, your wage, your pension or whatever. Think about your expenses. Now, if this line is under zero, that means you're spending more than you're earning. And you can look at what's happened since 2017, 2018, very, very negative. 2019 wasn't so bad. 2020, very, very negative. 2021, very, very negative. 2022, extremely negative. That was partly because of an accounting adjustment. So to be fair, it's not quite as bad as it looks, but that accounting adjustment was made up of things that should have been done in previous years, which means the previous results probably look a little bit better than what they ought to. But anyway, the long and the short of it is you're spending more money than what you're earning. Now, if that was your own budget, you would be concerned. As President Roosevelt famously said, we all know we can spend more money than we earn in a given year. But we also all know that if we keep doing that, we'll end up in the poorhouse. I'm not telling you anything new that you don't know from your own personal budget. If we can go to the next slide, please. So you would have heard that salaries went down. Uh, Deloitte made a big statement of this. This is actually your salaries over time. You know, deflated by revenue so we can make a fair comparison. You can see that that dotted line is definitely heading uphill. That means salaries did not go down. There's no debate about it. Salaries went up. Now, what you need to understand is that we've got an extremely large number of vacant positions at SVC. We haven't been able to get staff. Obviously, if we were able to get all the staff to fill all those positions, your salary would be even more higher than what it is at present. And I did a paper recently published at PMR. It's one of the best journals in the world. Excuse me. And in that paper, I show you that salaries statewide for amalgamated councils, just looking at the effect of amalgamation, controlling for everything else, salaries actually went up by 15.2%. So yours haven't gone up by quite that, anywhere near that much, but you've got all these vacant positions that you can't fill. I imagine if you could fill it, you would have had a similar result to other councils. Now, that is actually a problem. 
It's a problem because that's where most of the savings was supposed to be in staff costs, and we haven't saved at all. We've actually spent more money. It's also consistent with what happened in Queensland. Exactly the same thing happened in Queensland. And everyone said, oh, the staff savings will happen after three years when we can make people redundant. They had the same rules in Queensland. You know what actually happened after they can make people redundant? The salaries went up by more. They accelerated more and they kept accelerating. What worries me about the case in New South Wales is Queensland started good. They had efficiencies initially for quite a few years and significant savings and some staff savings. And then it went downhill very quickly and kept going downhill. New South Wales didn't start very good in the first place, mainly because of the way the state government implemented the amalgamations. So if we go and go to the next slide, please. So one of the problems is this IPPE, it's an accounting term. It stands for Infrastructure, Property, Plant and Equipment. It's your buildings, your roads, your machinery, your office equipment, et cetera. Now, this is a graph of what's happened to the value of those items since amalgamation. See what's happened since 2019? It's gone up dramatically, hasn't it, the last couple of years? And you know there's some big projects on the cards at the moment, the airport, the basketball court, things like that. So that line's going to go up even more. Now, it's gone up by about 24%. And you go, big deal, wow, we've got 24% more stuff. But you know what? You've now got 24% more maintenance to do. 24% more staff time has to be spent on this. 24% more depreciation. And depreciation is a, a measure of the consumption of these assets. It gets included as your expenses and gets taken away from your income. So effectively, what you've done is you've increased your cost base by 24%. What does it mean to a council? It means that they need to increase their revenue accordingly. How does that get done? Rate increases. So it's a bit like a story I like to tell people. I bought my first house. I was 20 years old, far too young. I was in the Commonwealth Bank and they gave me the home loan. They really shouldn't have done so because it was far too tight. And I discovered I really didn't have enough money to pay for things. And I had a couple options open to me. One was to earn more money and one was to spend a lot less money. And you know what I found? I had to do both. I started pizza delivering at night and I started drinking home brand coffee, which incidentally is quite disgusting and I don't recommend it as a tactic. It doesn't matter how desperate you are. And that's reality for your council too. They've got the same problem. And they've got two options. They can cut back expenditure or they can increase revenue and they're probably going to have to do both. If we can go to the next slide, please. So. Oh, Kasha SVC. Sorry, I'm I'm got the paper wrong. Jess is on task. I'm the one that's disorganised here. So this is a really important graph too. Now I explained the three different lines. The grey line is your externally restricted money. Remember that money you get given to do a particular thing, and you're not allowed to touch it for any other purpose, like the fifty bucks I get give you to give me a get me a card and a beer. That's not very helpful at all. But you can see it's gone through the roof, hasn't it? You've been given a lot of money. But as I said, if that's to build new infrastructure you didn't have before, that's just increasing your cost base as putting a millstone around your necks for the future and for your children and your grandchildren. So you, you need to think about that carefully about whether it's a benefit or not. It can be under certain circumstances, but it often isn't. The most important lines are that dark blue line, that's unrestricted cash. That's like money in the piggy bank we can use to plug deficits to deal with unexpected things that we didn't expect to happen, like bushfires and things like that while we're waiting for insurance to come through. What do you notice about that line? It's almost zero. Now, these are in thousands of dollars, so don't think that you're down to $5,000. You're down to $5 million for some of these things. But in a budget of $75 million, it's still pretty grim. It's pretty close to zero. And you can see that in 2021, it was actually negative. That meant not only was there no money in your piggy bank, you actually owed had an IOU sitting in your piggy bank. You owed people money on that particular fund. The other key fund is this internally restricted cash. That's money that's been put aside for particular things. This is not a slush fund. This is money that's been put aside for staff entitlements, money put aside for machinery that we know we have to fix, money for really important things like that. And what's been happening to that? 
we've had to be dipping into that to plug gaps. And you can see how quickly this is going down. So once again, go back to your personal budget and consider a couple of these slides. You're spending more money than you're earning. Your savings account's going down very, very sharply. And there's basically zero left in your piggy bank. Do you feel really financially sustainable and good about things? I doubt it. So if we can get to the next slide, please. So in sum, your financial sustainability has declined since amalgamation. And people who try, have in the past tried to suggest that it hasn't. Sorry, these figures are straight from audited financial statements using the state government's own metrics often. It's gone backwards. There's no way in the world T Corp would give you the same ratings unless they change their methodology. However, we've got this problem, whether we de-amalgamate or amalgamate, we need to do something about this financial sustainability. And just like my scenario when I bought my first house, it's going to involve a lot of pain and it's going to involve unpalatable things like drinking home brand coffee. It's going to mean we're going to have to cut back expenses and it's going to mean that we're going to have to increase revenue. We can increase fees and charges, but inevitably you're going to have to have yet another special rate variation. I anticipate it will be from 12% to 25%, depending on the precise decisions that councillors make in the future. If I was a councillor at this council, I'm speaking for myself, not for them. I'd be talking to the community this year about it, and I'd be applying for it at the end of this year because you're going to need this SRV. Now, that's going to happen whether you amalgamate or de-amalgamate. Sorry, I told you you wouldn't like a lot of things you were going to hear today, but I believe in telling people the truth as I see it, and that's how I see things. So you need to understand the situation you're in. And the reason why this is important is this. I think too many people are comparing de-amalgamation, which is scary because it involves change, yeah? I'm about to retire for health reasons, and it's as scary as anything changing my life, changing everything I do, my identity, everything. That's scary. It's always scary change. And But people are making mistakes comparing that scary change to what they have now as if it's all peaches and cream now. But you can't keep having what you have now. Within two years, things have to change radically or there's going to be crunch time. So what you need, to, the fair comparison is scary change, the amalgamation and scary change, making significant changes to revenue and expenses to make this council financially sustainable. Both options are scary. We can go on to the next slide, please. Now, as I said, the finance is just one out of 11 factors. There's another 10 factors. And what's typically happened in 2015 and 2021 with the Boundaries Commission is they, they look at each one of these factors because they have to buy law. Excuse me. And they say, oh, these things are different. And then they make up an excuse, but it doesn't matter because of such and such. Well, it does matter because if it didn't matter, these factors wouldn't have been written into the law in the first place. They were written into the law for a reason and a very good reason, which you will now find out. So there's a famous piece of work by one of the world's most famous economists. He's passed away, sadly, now. Wally Oates in America. And it's called the Decentralization Theorem. Another really good sleep aid. You can get the book quite cheaply now because he's passed on. It's a mathematical proof of what I've been telling you the whole time. And basically what he says is that smaller governments can be more efficient than larger ones. And he said that you should decentralise as much as possible because it will be more efficient. And he proves it mathematically. It's beyond dispute to anyone that can read the maths. Now, there's two main reasons that this happens. Number one reason is the smaller a community is, the more likely that the people are similar to each other. Now, why is that important? Well, pe when people are similar, they have similar tastes. They need and they want similar things. Now, from a local government or any government's perspective, if you have similar communities, it's easier to work out what you guys want because you're all mostly similar. You're all, you all mostly want the same sort of stuff. Now, the second reason it's important is government typically provides one level of services. It's really difficult and almost impossible to tailor different levels of services to each individual person. So the more similar people are, 
the easier it is to tailor the level of services to precisely what people want. The best way of thinking about it is this. Imagine you had a super rich community and you stuck it with a super poor community. What do you do? Do you provide the highest level of services and make everyone really happy that they're rich, but the poor people are broke because they can't afford to pay for it? Or do you provide the lowest level of services that the poor people can afford to pay for, but now the rich people are all upset because they want much more higher levels of services that they could afford? You can't make everyone happy, can you? And the more those differences exist, the harder it is to be efficient. It's structural inefficiency because of differences in the communities. Now, that's why this community of interest, history and geography are important. What is community of interest? It's your natural patterns of activity. I'm not talking about your one-off trip to, to uh, Tuma or Tumbarumba to do a one-off unusual event. I'm talking about where do you normally drive to go to the doctor, to go to the shop, to visit friends, where are your friends and family most likely to reside? Now, those things happen over time because of history and geography. It's quite remarkable. Now, if you look at Tumbarumba, they had the train line put back, put in, I think it was 1921, okay, and it went to Wagga Wagga. Now, back in those days, your other options was a horse or a very slow, unreliable car. A train was like way, way faster, wasn't it? Three, four times faster. So what were people in Tumbarumba most likely to orientate them towards doing at that time because of the train line going through? Going to Wagga Wagga if they needed a doctor or a big shop, Yeah. And as a result, you'll find that a lot of Tumbarumba people have rallies or friends in Wagga Wagga, and they still think about going to Wagga Wagga because of this thing that happened way back in 1921. They're just naturally orientated in that direction because once upon a time, it was way, way quicker to get to Wagga Wagga than Schumann. And same for geography. Geography is actually why the train line didn't go up to Schumann because you couldn't get it over a range. You can't get a train up a great big dirty hill, not back in those days. But geography also makes a difference to what you farm and how you farm. And that makes difference to people's orientations too. So obviously they farm different things in Tumba to what they do in Schumann. Now it's probably safer to talk about where I come from, Kenworth and Urella. I used to live in Urella up the top of the tablelands. They're all fine wool merino farmers. Sheep farmers have to do a lot more work. They tend to be descendants of the rich lords of of England and they tend to be a little bit more upwardly mobile. My family originally comes from Tamworth and I've moved back down the hill to Tamworth. That's more like industry, uh, cattle farming. They tend not to have to do so much with their animals. They tend not to be the descendants of those more upwardly mobile people and they tend to have more plainer tastes and be le a little bit less involved in government things. Now, that influences people's what they expect from government, what they ask from government, how much they get involved in government. And that influences their tastes. And that's what's happened here. The tastes of people in the southern region are very, very different to the tastes of people in the northern region. And it's because of geography and history and these ordinary patterns of, of, uh, patterns of behaviour. And all of those things mean because we've got those different tastes, it means that we've got structural inefficiency built in. It is hard for your council to work out what you want because you're so different. And it's almost impossible for, to give everyone what you want because you want completely different things. And that is a structural inefficiency that's being built into the system. Okay, if we can go to the next slide, please. So now I get on to what I think is probably one of the most important factors, although there's no reason in the legislation to prioritise one factor over another. But I'll tell you why this is important. This is your staff. It says the effects on staff, and everyone keeps talking about full-time equivalent numbers and numbers of staff, but that's not actually what the legislation talks about. It talks about the effects on staff, the impacts on staff. And this is important for a couple of reasons. The first reason is your most valuable asset is not the money in your bank. It's not your equipment or your building. It's your staff. You have, if you have no staff, you have no council. If you lose your good staff, you can't run an efficient good council. It doesn't matter how much you want to. 
your staff are your most valuable asset. The other reason why it's really important is that your staff know the organisation far better than I will ever know it, or you will ever know, it, or your councillors will ever know, it, or your senior management will ever know it. Why? Because they're working day in, day out doing the job. People who are actually doing the job know how best to do the job. They know where the waste is. They know what's possible. They know how to make it better. It's as simple as that. Next slide, please. So I had a lot of questions in the surveys, and there's a number of questions using a very reputable perceived stress scale that they use in America a lot. Yungji, my colleague from Korea, suggested this. It's used a lot in the research. I'm not that fast on those psychological test scales and add up all the points and everything else, but I needed some evidence. But I augmented that evidence. I worked the phones really, really hard. I probably talked to 40%, 50% of your staff, so I augmented that with what I'd heard as well. And I worked out all the scores, and what did I find? Have a look at that grey box there. 16% of your staff are highly stressed. That is a real worry that the current arrangements are stressing so many of your staff. It's a worry because it impacts their personal lives, impacts their mental health, impacts their physical health. And why are they stressed? Because they really want to deliver for you. They're like you and I and everyone else. You just want to do your job really, really well. But they come up against a structure that's making it harder for them to deliver for you. So I think we need to have a... a, a uh, a national day, let's hug a staff member day or something like that. We all need to go out of our way in the next couple of weeks and say, thank you. We know you're copying it. We know you're trying to do your best and your back's up against the wall. Thank you for trying anyway. And I think that would change a lot because a lot of these, I'm not talking about a little bit of stress, like I'm a little bit anxious. I'm talking about super stress. And I've heard some stories that would curl your hair the effects that this has had on people's mental and physical health. So that's really important. And one of the reasons why this stress occurs, it could be because of bad management. And that's what the Boundaries Commission said. And they quite rightly said, well, bad managers come and go. And if that's got nothing to do with amalgamation, well, that's not our problem. But once again, this will probably be safer to talk about my own situation than to talk about your situation for your council staff. Now, I used to work for, for University of New England when I was in Urala. And I drive to work every day like a normal employee. And then UTS stole me off them. And then UON has stole me off UTS. The last two universities that stole me, the deal is I work for my farm in Moonby. You want me to work for, for you. You either come to me or I work for my farm, but I'm not going to Sydney or Newcastle. I don't like cities. Okay. And that's all fine and good. And I've got some staff that work under me and I need to know what's going on. But you know the problem? I'm not there at Newcastle. So I don't hear all those conversations. You know, people will be walking past the desk and go, oh, that's right, I meant to tell Joseph such and such. By the way, Joseph, I'm doing such and such, and that impacts your life. Or, by the way, Joseph, I need to steal this staff member. Because I'm not there, people forget about it. And because I'm not there, I'm not at the water cooler. You know how many really important discussions happen at the water cooler or the staff room or sometimes the dunnies? If you're not there, you don't hear those discussions. And people can't be in tumbarumba and tumour at the same time until we get teleportation devices. And by talking to some of these people who have been severely impacted in the, in the past, what I found out was that there's two things that have impacted them. One is the, the stress of driving down that road. For some people, that is stressful. But I think the biggest thing is they haven't been privy to these conversations. And a lot of people have interpreted that as workplace bullying. And it does actually fit the description of workplace bullying sometimes what happens to me. But I stop and I think, okay, it was my choice to work in Moonby. I've just got to suck it up. My problem. But your, your staff members didn't have that choice. And they, as I say, it doesn't matter what they do. They can't be in both places at once. So there's a structural driver of this stress. And that's what worries me. The same things that resulted in really, really bad outcomes for people still exist. Irrespective of what happens to the management, you cannot be in both places at once. You still have to drive from one place to another if you're going to go between the spots. Next slide, please. So the picture of the bike there is called William uh, Deming. 
It was an economist in America. In the 1950s, the Americans realized they were being whipped by the Japanese. The Japanese were making better cars, cheaper cars, and that people wanted to buy Japanese cars instead of American cars. So they sent him out to Japan to find out what was going on. You know what he found out? He found out that senior management and executives in Japan went and talked to the people actually doing the work. They went and talked to the person who made the steering wheel or the handle or the uh, glove box or whatever and said, how can we make this car better? And strangely enough, the person that did it all day every day would know how to make it better, wouldn't they? Because they're doing the job all day every day. It just makes common sense. Well, that's why I put a lot of emphasis on this next graph. So I asked in the next two graphs, in fact, I asked staff, do you think we've delivered on those promises that the minister made? Remember the promises I read out from 2015? And 44% of staff said not at all. But just be careful with those two blues, one's light and one's dark. 44% said we didn't at all deliver on those promises. And I think that's a bit of an extreme response, as I suggested to you. Surely we delivered on some of them in a marginal way. We got 3% of people that said we extremely well delivered on those promises. And I also find that an extreme result because I don't think we extremely well delivered on all those promises at all. I think the people in the middle are probably a little bit more representative. So 25% said we slightly delivered on the promises. You had 25% plus 44%, you got over two thirds of your staff saying, no, we didn't deliver on all those promises. Why is that important? Well, A, it's explaining a lot of the stress that these staff are feeling. They're getting a bit of flack from the community, but they're giving themselves a bit of flack too because they think they should be able to deliver on these promises. But unfortunately, the structure is stopping them, preventing them from doing so, and they feel bad about it. It just shows you how good your staff is, doesn't it? Uh, the other reason why it's important is, remember that negativity bias I talked to you about. The bigger the gap between the promises and what actually happens, the bigger the grudge that some people will hold and the more likely they are to do something about the grudge. And I know what you're thinking. It's probably true. Next slide, please. So the next question is, should SBC remain amalgamated? This wasn't the precise question. Basically, I phrased it. I had to bias it one way. I biased it towards staying amalgamated because I want to be conservative. And what we find here is, be careful with the two blues, remember. 39% of staff strongly disagree that you should stay amalgamated, i.e. 39% of staff think that you should de-amalgamate. Another 14% of staff disagree that you should remain amalgamated. So you add those two numbers together, you've got 53% of staff think you should de-amalgamate. These are the people doing the job day in, day out, not only that, but these are the people that bear the consequence of the decision that your community and your councillors make. They're the ones that have to do an awful lot of extra work for six to 12 months if you decide to de-amalgamate. Yet we still have the majority of staff saying they think the best bet is to de-amalgamate. I find that quite compelling. 21% of people say they're neutral. They don't have enough information. And I read all the comments. So I've got a bit more information than this. And mostly what people were writing, a lot of people in the written uh, surveys would write extra stuff for me. Mostly it seems that they didn't have all the information and they don't have the information when they were filling in the surveys that you have today, okay? They haven't seen this information. So they didn't know that the state government pays the cost of the amalgamation. They didn't know your sustainability situation and things like that. I think that if those 21% of people were surveyed again, I don't think they would be sitting on the fence anymore. I think a, a lot of them, probably most of them, would be saying, I disagree. So the majority disagree, but we need to think about everyone. And this is a problem. You can't make everyone happy. There's over a quarter of your staff think you should stay amalgamated. And the sorts of things they're saying, I also get. You know, we've done so much work. We don't want to put it to waste. We've made good uh, some good improvements to the community. We don't want that to go to waste. We've made important relationships. We don't want that to go to waste. And I agree. If you de-amalgamate, there's no need to throw the baby out with the bath water. We need to keep all the good things if your, you and your councillors decide to de-amalgamate. We need to keep as much of those good things as possible and build on them. It would be an absolute travesty to let them go to waste. 
It would also be an absolute travesty if your staff were ever led to believe from the community that it was their fault, because it's not their fault. It wasn't the councillor's fault either. It wasn't the management's fault either. It was a structural inefficiency. They were never going to win. They tried their hardest. They're a good group of people who tried very, very hard to deliver for you, and they're just as upset as you are. Remember, a lot of them are rate payers too. They've got these special rate variations and everything else. If we go to the next slide, you'll see what I mean. I ask these three questions. What's the most important thing to you if we de-amalgamate? What's the second most important thing? What's the third most important thing? What you see is I put the top three responses on, and there's usually a big gap to the next response. What you see is the most important thing there, none, none of it's about initial workload. They're not worried about themselves, most, are they? Who are they worried about? You guys. They're worried about the cost of the amalgamation. They're worried about financial sustainability. They're worried about having enough staff. They're not worried about yourself. And I find that quite incredible. If I was a staff member, I'd think about myself first. I think, oh, gee, that's an awful lot of work to do. Do I really want to go through that? That would be my most important. I'm being brutally honest with you. That would be my most important consideration. And then I think about you guys later. Your staff didn't do that. They thought about you first and then they thought about themselves later. So you see the second most important thing is the workload. Third most important thing, workplace disruption, similar sort of concept there. So they are worried about those things. And you would have to work very hard to support your staff, to let them know that you really value everything they're doing, that you really understand it's an awful lot of extra work to them, and you really value everything they're doing for you. And I don't think you guys have gone out of your way to do that up until now. And I'd encourage you, you all see staff members from time to time, just say thanks. It's not that hard. Okay, because if you lose them, then you really are in deep, deep trouble. I've also done an overall top three things. What's the most important thing to them? Having sufficient staff. You know we've got vacancies. We know we can't fill them. Part of that is the uncertainty. I'd like to see the uncertainty finish at the end of this process. The councils either don't decide to de-amalgamate or not. The evidence is in my evidence brief that if they decided to run with it, they'd probably get it. But after that, it needs to, needs to come to an end. We just need to get rid of this uncertainty. We can't have 16% of our staff extremely stressed because of uncertainty. It just needs to stop, okay? Cost of the amalgamation, as I say, the staff didn't probably didn't know that the state government picks up the tab and quite broadly, so that's not really an important thing. And financial sustainability, a lot of staff do realise you're in a bit of a pickle. I don't think they realise how much of a pickle you were in. And I think a lot of people did buy the story that small councils can't be sustainable because unlike me, they didn't do the econometrics and find out that, oh, hold, 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 hold up, it's the exact opposite of what we think. It was a surprise to me as well. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide, please. And this gets back to that same point. How often are your staff stressed by this uncertainty? 16% of staff are saying they're very often concerned about the uncertainty over will we de-amalgamate or not. A further 22% of people are saying they're fairly often concerned about that. Add those two numbers together, 38% of your staff are saying they're thinking about this a fair bit. That's why I say we need to draw a line under it. Your councillors need to make a firm decision. You need to give them feedback. And they need to run with the decision and prosecute it, and it needs to be an end, where, whichever way you go, okay? We can't keep this up. This is what's causing staff to, to leave. This is one of the factors causing you to have difficulty in getting staff, and we simply cannot fill really important vacancies. And I don't know what we'll do if we lose many more staff if we can't fill those vacancies. It's a real problem. That's why I say I, I probably said 10 times now, Go and say something nice to a staff member today. Next slide, please. So in summary, your staff are your most valuable asset. Stop fixating on money. Start fixating on your staff. We must protect this asset. We must do far more than what we've been doing up until this point in time. And the staff need to know that you value them. You know that they worked as hard as possible and they did as good a job as possible and that you value them whichever way you go. It's not a reflection on them. Okay, next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about money and what would happen should there be a de-amalgamation. Now, I'm very critical of the work in the past for good reason. What they did in the past was they got this thing called a long-term financial plan. It's basically a 10-year budget of council. 
Now, if you've been looking at council budgets, you'll know that this particular council is not very good at their budgeting. Most councils aren't very good at their budgeting, but we've had problems here. Last year, we missed our budget by 40%. Imagine if you missed your personal budget by 40%. You spent 40% more than what you anticipated you would spend. Probably put you in a bit of a pickle. The year before, they missed it by 40%. The year before, they missed it by 20%. The year before, they missed it by 20%. Now, in the past, the Lloyds and KPMG have got these long-term financial plans, and they've said, on the basis of that, we'll assume those those projections are right. Well, we know they, they're not even right one year in advance, so why would you think they'd be right 10 years in advance? When then they're going to decide how how much will be how much it will work for Tumut and how much it will work for Tumbarumba. But they admit in their own report, although we never got to see the full reports and we don't know who wrote these reports because they didn't front up to you or anything like that and the full reports are secret, my report will not be secret. They then say, well, we don't know how much revenue each emerging council would have and we don't know how much of the cash they'll get. and We don't even really know what the expenses are but we'll base it on this 10-year plan that we know is wrong and we'll tell you exactly what you'll look like in five years' time or in 20 years' time. And you know that KPMG got it badly wrong and you know that Deloitte's has got it badly wrong because those five years have expired and all the things they said would happen didn't happen. And I'm not stupid. I'm not going to make the same foolish mistake, okay? It's an exercise in futility to use numbers that we know is wrong and try to draw some conclusion to it. The only thing I can guarantee is that well, I would be wrong. So I'm quite a conservative, risk-averse person. What I'm going to do is tell you about the definite extra cost and the definite extra savings. I'm going to tell you about some of the other things too, but I'm not going to include them in my final answer because I don't know whether those other things will happen or not as a sure thing. See, a lot of it's down to how good your management is and how good your counsellors are, what decisions they make. And I can't tell the future. I'm not in their heads. I don't know what decisions they make. I hope they make good decisions, but they may not make the good decisions. So I will give you a range of outcomes. So if we go to the next slide here, we can talk about some of the things I definitely know will happen. You'll have a significant saving in travel costs. This was totally ignored by KPMG and Deloitte's and the Boundaries Commission. I did a survey of your staff travel for one week. They had to write down who it was, how far they traveled, when they left, when they got back, rah, rah, rah. And I worked it out and I multiplied the number of kilometers by 78 cents per K, which is what the Australian Tax Department says it costs. And I added in the staff time using the wage of the actual staff members when I could find their wage. And this is an underestimate because there was a couple of key staff that travel a lot that weren't there that week. And there's some staff I couldn't find out what their wage was. So it is an underestimate. You know it came to more than $1 million per year in travel just to go from Tumut to Tumbarumba. Well, if you're de-amalgamated, you won't be driving to Tumut and Tumbarumba all the time, will you? So you won't have that $1 million in expense. And remember, that is an underestimate. Now, there is an additional cost which the Boundaries Commission and Deloitte and KPMG ignored, and that's auditing and assurance costs. So we produce financial statements end of every financial year. They must be audited by the Auditor General or his delegate. We also have the thing called the Audit and Risk Improvement Committee. It's like an internal audit committee, and that costs money to run. Now, your audit costs are far higher than comparable councils, and that's a reflection of the complexity of this council, particularly at this moment in time. So the cost won't double. You'll have two times count, two times as many councils. Some of you think, oh, those costs are going to double. But your costs are extraordinarily high already because of the complexity you've got at present. So the costs won't quite double. They'll go up by about $90,000 per year. Okay, now there is potential to have shared services in your ARIC committee, and that would reduce that a smidgen. So there are definite savings and definite costs that we ignored last time. Now, there's some potential extra money you would get, but I'm not counting this potential stuff, but I'll tell you about it anyway, because I can't be sure. There's some grants that are provided to each council, and if there's two councils instead of one council, you're going to get twice as much overall as a community. And as the Boundaries Commission rightly pointed out, the factor actually talks about the community as a whole 
So by legislation, we should be looking at the community as whole, not about separate communities. So if for those grants, such as library grants, I think they're about 60 or 70 grand, you'd get twice as many. When there's disaster, the grants are usually per council. You'd get twice as many, assuming the disaster went through both council areas. There's things like that. There's another great big pocket of grants called the Financial Assistance Grants, very unfortunately abbreviated to FAGS. As my older son said, what on earth were the people thinking when they came up with financial assistance grants that was never going to end well? Anyway, this is money from the Commonwealth Government that gets passed to councils by the state governments, meant to make up for horizontal fiscal inequity, the fact that some areas are richer than others, it meant, it's meant to even things out. And there's actually a way that's prescribed in the legislation that must be transparent and accountable and achieve all these things. But unfortunately, our local government grants commission in New South Wales doesn't seem to think that the legislation applies to them. I wrote to them and I got a very nasty letter in reply. And they won't tell anyone what they're doing, despite the fact that the, the Commonwealth legislation that enables them says specifically that it must be transparent and accountable. So I can't tell you precisely what the outcome will be. However, because there's a component there for vertical fiscal imbalance, it should result in you getting slightly more per de-amalgamated council, but I can't be sure of it, so I won't include it. So these things I can't be sure of, I'm not including. A thing I can be sure of is that you'll need additional staff. You're going to have two local governments, you're going to have, have two GMs, two CFOs, two sets of directors, there's other key staff that you need as well. There's some staff that you'll need in the remnant council, what's currently SBC. Now, I've priced that according to similar sized councils. It will be about $1.3 million. But these senior salaries are negotiated. And I don't know how the negotiations will go precisely because I don't tell the future. I don't have a crystal ball. So it might be 1.4, might be 1.2. Now, there's potential savings too because the existing GMs and directors and some of those salaries that were moved up, potentially you can't reduce their salary while they're on a contract. Most of them are on contracts. That would just be completely wrong and it's unlawful anyway, but you can't do that. You can't write what you think is a wrong by making another wrong. It's not going to solve the problem. And it's just not fair anyway, is it? But when those contracts expire or the people move on to another job, you could re-advertise them cheaper potentially. Why do I say that? As I said before, usually the salaries are a reflection of the size of the budget and how many staff they have to look after. If the councils are de-amalgamated and one council's two-thirds of the size that it used to be, the chances are that you could reduce those salaries for the senior management a little bit when they come up for renewal. And some of the salaries were popped up because of harmonisation when you first amalgamated. There's potential when some of those jobs have to be re-advertised, you could re-advertise them lower. But I can't be sure of them. They're only potential savings, so I won't include them. I'd rather give you worst case scenario and you to have a smile on your face and send nice, warm, fuzzy feelings up to me and Moonby than give you the best case scenario and you not have that best case scenario work out and then you send hate thoughts up to me and Moonby so I'm giving you worst case scenarios. I'm not including things that I can't be sure of. There's additional councillor costs. I went to the remuneration tribunal uh, ruling. That's what sets councillor fees. That's about uh, an extra $101,000 per year. There was talk of having one less councillor in the former Tumbarumba southern area. I don't think it would be worthwhile to tell you. The bang for the buck is just not there. A lot of your councillors are doing an awful lot of work, a lot of work that you would have to have staff members doing otherwise. They're actually very, very cheap labour in most instances. I know everyone doesn't like councillors, but most of your councillors are working very hard for you. For the little bit of money they get, I just don't think there's a payoff to have one less councillor, to tell you the truth. There's potential savings there. You know what I did? I compared the total cost, the remuneration of the councillors plus their expenses from 2015 to last year. You know it only went down by $17,000, even though your councillor numbers went down considerably. Now, why is that? Well, superannuation councillors came in. But a big part of that is the travel allowances. Every time your councillors drive from Tumut down to Tumbarumba or vice versa, your mayor's at Tumbarumba at the moment, he comes up to Tumut to do a meeting like he did last night, he's entitled to claim 
mileage allowance. And he'd be mad not to, wouldn't it? Because it's costing us his car that he's driving. If he does it for free all the time, he's going to end up being working not only for free for the community, but actually paying money to work as your mayor. So those costs will be reduced substantially. But once again, I can't be sure of that, so I haven't included it. So don't just think about the extra 100000 for the councillors. Remember that there's a significant amount. We're talking tens and tens of thousands of dollars of allowances that would no longer be claimed. But I can't be sure that they won't suddenly decide, find reasons to drive all around the countryside. So I'm not including it. I'm giving the worst case scenario. Possible savings from reduced structural inefficiency. Remember that FDH analysis we did? We can use that to work out what is the value of those structural inefficiencies. And it's proved to be very precise. I did some work for a council out this way prior to amalgamation. And, after, and I said how much extra it would cost after amalgamation. I was almost smack bang on the dollar. It was remarkable. I did some FDH DEA analysis prior to amalgamations for the whole state, and I said how it would work out for the whole state, and I was almost precisely correct to the percentage. Why? Because we're using actual data, and the, rather than guesswork, which is what everyone else used, using actual data, and we're assuming if you perform on average and make the same sort of decisions on average as all the other councils, this is what could happen. And what does that tell me? And I've excluded the travel savings. It tells me that there's another $1.1 million of potential savings that should be possible if the two new councils on average performed like other councils those sizes. But I can't be sure that. I can't be sure that they'll perform on average like other average councils. So I have not included that $1.1 million in the figure that you'll see in the next slide, which we're about to turn to. Wasn't that an awesome segue? Yes, mm -hmm. you'll be impressed with that. Okay, so this is the range. And sorry, I can't give you precise numbers like Deloitte and KPMG gave you, but those precise numbers were rubbish anyway, so there was no point giving you them. It is a range depending on how good the decision-making goes. You could be half a million dollars a year worse off or you could be about $600,000 a year better off. And that will depend on the decisions that other people make that is out of my control. As you will see, there is more upside, chances of upside than downside. It is more likely, particularly because I haven't included a lot of those savings, which I think are pretty likely, it's more likely that you'll be slightly better off than worse off. Now you're thinking $500,000, gee, that's an awful lot of money. Well, it is. I wish someone would give it to me if they don't want it. But when you think about it in terms of the budget of a local government, $75 million, you know that 500000 is less than three quarters of a percent of your expenditure? It's, that's the worst case scenario. It's very, very little. You've got to, this is the thing, you've got to drag yourself out of your personal budget and now for a minute and think this is an organisation that spends $75 odd million dollars a year $500,000 to them is probably like $500 to you, yeah? So, yes, it's big, but go back to what I told you about Aristotle and the Russian-built Lada cars. You need to think about the price in terms of what you're getting. If this money meant that you went from having a defective Lada car to having a Toyota that actually stops when a car stops in front of you, would that be worth it? You've got to think about what would you get for this potential extra expense. And you've got to remember that it may not be an extra expense. It might be a slight win. Okay, I can't tell you for sure because I won't be running the process. I won't be running both councils. Okay, so that's the answer. I know it's not the definite answer you probably wanted and expected, but you know what? All those definite answers you had in the past were completely and absolutely wrong. So I haven't made the same mistakes as those other people. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I've got to give you a final verdict. I could sit on the fence. It'd be the easiest thing for me to do and it'd be the safest thing for me to do, but it would get you absolutely nowhere as a community. But you need to think about things with your eyes open. And a lot of people forget this. My new favourite saying is everyone's got an angle and everyone does. You know my angle? Come Saturday, I fly back to Moonbi 
and I don't bear the consequences. It's not me that bears the consequences of this decision. I'm not anywhere near as emotionally involved in this as you guys. I actually came to care for your community a lot, which is why I promised to myself never to do a job like this again. I actually find it heart-wrenching to see all the horrible things that happen and to know that in front of me I've got to recommend an answer and I don't like either answer. It's as simple as that. You know the only answer I like? I want to be like Doctor Who. I want to go into the TARDIS. I want to fly back to 2015. There's a couple of heads of people I want to get and I want to smash them together until, until they see some common sense. But I can't do that. And it's not fair for me to sit on the side of the fence. But please understand it's not an easy decision. Here is my verdict, though. I think you should de-amalgamate. You've got some huge challenges to face in the next two years. Absolutely massive challenges. I don't think people really appreciate how big those challenges are. And you can either face those challenges as two simpler structures without some angst, without structural inefficiencies, without stress on the staff. There's much stress on the staff. The amalgamation is stress as well. You can face that in a simpler, less stressful, more efficient scenario, or you can continue being amalgamated and have those structural efficiencies, have that angst from some communities, have staff feeling stressed and upset that they can't deliver on those problems, uh, promises. I think that you will find it easier to meet those challenges as simpler, more efficient, smaller organisations. It's as simple as that. And the things that really drive me here is my concern for your staff and your representatives for their mental and physical well-being, because those structural problems that have led to absolutely horrifying outcomes for people's personal lives in the past, they're still there. They're still possible risks. I'm also conscious of the opportunity to reset things and start again with a clean slate. And that's what I need to get you to think about next. This is not going back to the future. We're not going back to Tumor and we're not going back to Tumbarumba. I wouldn't want you to do that. I want you to learn from the good things that happen. Keep as many of these good things as possible. I want you to learn. Some communities need to learn to feel what it feels like not to be the major stakeholder with most of the people and to remember that feeling and to use that feeling when they're interacting with some of the smaller communities. We could take this as a really positive thing these six years and move forward and be better than ever, or we can get bogged down and blame games and forget the lessons of the past and ditch the baby with the bath water and get nothing out of the six years. I want you to get the maximum possible out of the six years. Okay, next slide, please. Now you get to fill in the surveys. And you get to ask questions and I get to have a proper drink of tea. So I'll stop talking now and hand it over to Jess to MC things and we'll turn the video.